Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the new Sherlock Holmes story, Murder in the Locked Room? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure took place many, many years ago. It began on a gray and murky afternoon in Baker Street. We just finished tea, I remember, and Holmes was busying himself with some chemical experiments. For some time, he sat there in silence with his long, thin back curved over a, a retort in which he was brewing a particularly malodorous product. As I glanced across at him, seated there under the gaslight, his head was sunk upon his breast, and he looked like a strange, lank bird with dull gray plumage and a black top knot. Suddenly, he turned to me and spoke. So, Watson, you've decided not to invest in South African securities? Huh? How nice to know that, Holmes? Huh? It isn't really difficult. I observe a groove between your left forefinger and thumb. Groove? It is enough to tell me that you do not intend to invest your small capital in the gold fields. I see no connection, groove. And yet the train of thought is elementary. Hmm? One, you had chalk between your thumb and finger when you returned from your club. Two... You put chalk there when you play billiards. Three, you never play billiards except with Marston. Four, you told me about a month ago that Marston had an option on some South African property which would expire in four weeks and which he desired you to share with him. Five, your checkbook is locked in my drawer and you have not asked for the key. Number six is the logical conclusion. You've decided not to invest your money in this oh. manner. <laughs> Absurdly simple. I oh. knew you'd say that. I wonder who that is. Were you expecting a client? No, Watson, but I hope it is one. My practice has been decidedly slack lately. Go and see who it is, will you? Yes, of course, sir. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. I'll show the gentleman in. Uh, this way, sir. Good, good evening. I'm, I'm Dr. Watson. How do you do? My name is Chudley Stoner. Oh, come along in, Mr. Stoner. Thank you. And this must be the great Sherlock Holmes. My name is Holmes. The adjective is your own, Mr. Stoner. Sit down, won't you? Thanks. I don't imagine you know anything about me, Mr. Holmes. Nothing beyond the fact that you went to Eton and Oxford, that you have a beautiful and socially prominent wife, and that you contribute to the Strand magazine with some regularity. <laughs> I'm disappointed in not receiving one of your famous deductive analyses, Mr. Holmes, but I'm glad that my name is familiar to you. You contribute to the Strand magazine, sir, too? Uh, that's very interesting, Mr. Stella. Uh, perhaps you read some of my... Uh... My uh, humble efforts. Uh, yes, indeed, Doctor. Uh, Very colorful stories they are. Oh, thanks very much. Don't, don't mind my saying so, Mr. Oh, Stoner. Your own oh, stories, oh. which uh, also deal with the world of crime, seem to me to be even more sensational than Watson's. Probably because he has the facts to work with, whereas I have to depend on my gift of imagination. But the reason I've come to you tonight, Mr. Holmes, has nothing to do with imagination. I find myself mixed up in a real-life murder that is as puzzling as any problem I've dealt with in fiction. A murder, Mr. Stoner? I say, really, you well, don't... The please. Oh. Well, Mr. Holmes, I'll give them to you as briefly and concisely as possible. I just got back from Paris yesterday. My secretary went with me. He did not return. The French police say he committed suicide. I know that he didn't. Oh, how do you know that, Mr. Stoner? The boy had everything in the world to live for. No financial worries and a very promising future ahead of him. Hmm. Please describe the circumstances under which his body was found. Well, uh, I'd left him alone in his room. When I came to fetch him, there was no answer to my knock. I tried to look through the keyhole, but the key was in the lock from the inside, and I could see nothing. After some time it elapsed, I got worried. A friend of mine, an inspector of the police, was dining with me that night, and he suggested we should investigate. We broke down the door. My secretary was dead, a bullet in his heart. Inside a room, locked from the inside. Huh? Obviously, the police were right in thinking that it was suicide, Mr. Stoner. Of course, you examined the room thoroughly for traces of some other method of ingress? Meticulously. The windows were locked tight. No uh, sliding panels? None. Where was the revolver? Beside his right hand, one bullet gone. And you say the key was in the inside of the door? Yes, and that's why the police wrote it off as suicide. Mr. Holmes... How would you explain such a situation? I'd like a few more facts before giving an opinion. You say you examined the room meticulously. Was there no uh, oddity? Nothing out of place? Nothing uh, peculiar in that room? Nothing that I noticed. Perhaps uh, a small pellet of wax, eh? Yes, by Joe. I did find a wax pellet. It was lying on the carpet near the door, and I couldn't imagine what he was doing there. Well, there's your answer. Uh, one more question. This French inspector who entered the room with you... What was his personal relationship with your secretary? 
Odd that you should ask that. They'd quarreled the night before about some girl at the Folie Bergère. Then there you have it, Mr. Stoner. The murderer left the room, locked the door from the outside, removed the key and plugged the keyhole with wax. When the room was broken into, he simply slipped the key into the inside of the lock, thereby dislodging the wax pellet. Obviously, from what you've told me, only the inspector had that opportunity. Great Scott, a French police inspector, a murderer? Holmes, what are you going to do about this? Nothing, old chap. What? Huh? Beyond uh, Nothing, chap? wishing Mr. Stoner good luck with the editor of the Strand magazine. I don't think I follow you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, come now, Mr. Stoner. It's an intellectual game and, uh, in its way, quite stimulating. But don't think you can hoodwink me so easily. Holmes, what are you talking about? My dear Watson, I read the papers carefully. And what do the papers have to do with this? I've noticed the presence of you and your lovely wife at so many social functions here in London in the past few days that I'm afraid I can't possibly accept your Paris story. The obvious answer remains, you've come to me with an imaginary problem in order to solve a difficulty in one of your stories. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, you're even smarter than I gave you credit for. But this is disgraceful, sir, wasting my friend's time like this. I suppose I should apologize, Mr. Holmes, but here's the way it happened. I came home late last night, a little uh, under the weather. I had the most wonderful idea on earth for a story. I was going to call it The Locked Room. I'm convinced I made some notes on the story last night, but when I wakened this morning, I couldn't find them. All I could remember was the problem, but I had no idea how to solve it, and so I came to you. I see it's an excellent idea for a story. Though I have known similar locked room problems, in fact, I don't recall that fiction has exploited their possibilities as Holmes, yet. Holmes, why are you so calm? I think it's outrageous to come here and pick your brains for a story. My dear Watson, how else do you get the material for your own masterpieces? Oh, that's not very funny. Should you grudge it to him? Hmm? Well, it's not the same thing at all. I must say, you're being very sporting about it, Mr. Holmes. Oh, no, Mr. Stoner. I'm being businesslike. May I ask how much you are in the habit of receiving for a story of yours in the Strand magazine? About 20 guineas. Why? I am a consultant detective, and I think I've given you a valuable opinion. My fee, if you sell your story, will be 10 guineas. Good night to you, Mr. Stoner. There you are, Monsieur Stoner. A remarkable deduction, André. Yes, here I am. I've spent all afternoon searching for those notes on the story. I could not find any trace of them. And yet I could swear I did some work when I came in last night. You are sure I didn't give you some dictation? Oh, quite sure, Monsieur Stoner. If you will pardon my saying so, you were a little... Yes, uh... yes, go on, André, say it. The secretary has some rights. I was drunk. That's what you mean, isn't it? Oh, I meant no offense. It'd be rather a relief if you did. You're always so infernally polite. Where's my wife? She's in the library with your brother-in-law, Monsieur Seal. Very well. I'll need you after dinner, André. I'm going to work on the story tonight. Yes, Monsieur Stoner. Hello, Chad. I was beginning to worry about you not being back for dinner. I stopped at the club. Good evening, Chad. Hello, Henry. And how is our master of the violin this evening? Chad, don't make fun of my brother like that. Yes, Chad, go easy. I can't learn the violin in two easy lessons, you know. Violet accompanied me on the piano just now. She says I'm improving. I don't doubt that you're improving. You couldn't become worse. Chad, you're intolerable. Henry's our guest. An unwanted guest as far as I'm concerned. He's been here two months. Why doesn't he try and get himself a job instead of mooning around here all day scraping away at his fiddle? That's the last time you've insulted me, Chad. I'm leaving here in the morning. I hope I can count on it. How dare you, Chad? How dare you? If Henry goes in the morning, I shall go with him. Now, Violet, take it easy. You've been drinking again, and you're disgusting when you drink. You made an absolute fool of yourself in front of André last night. You're very protective about him. Are you sure those calf eyes he keeps making at you are entirely unreciprocated? I hate you, Chad. I'm not waiting until the morning. I'm leaving tonight. Now, wait a minute, Violet. I'm sorry. I don't know what makes me do it. I get a few drinks and I just feel that I've got to hurt you. Well, you certainly succeed. I used to think it was the so-called artistic temperament that made you this way. Now I realize it's drink. I'm sorry, Violet, but it's not been too easy for me. Having Henry around all day gets pretty trying, particularly when I'm attempting to work. But he's planning to move soon anyway. Surely you can tolerate it a little longer for our sake, Chad, can't you? Of course I can, Violet. I'm sorry, dear. I'll try and be a little less boorish and uh, I'll watch the drinking. That sounds more like the man I married. And I'll help, too. I'll try and keep Henry out of your way as much as possible, dear. We can make a go of it, Violet. I know we can. 
Well, I'm going into the study. I want to jot down some notes on the new story while they're still fresh in my mind. All right, dear. Dinner will be in about half an hour. I'll call you. Fine. The Locked Room. Yes, that'll be a good title. Hmm. It'll be worth giving Sherlock Holmes ten guineas for the help he gave me. Who is it? Is that you? <coughs> I'm flattered that you dropped by to see me, Inspector Lestrade. Not a business visit, I gather. Bless you, no, Mr. Dams. You'll have a whiskey and soda, won't you, Lestrade? Thank you kindly, Dr. Watson. Uh, not too much soda, if you don't mind. The uh, London criminal is becoming a dull dog these days, Lestrade. My own practice has been remarkably slow in the past few weeks. Uh, same thing with us at Scotland Yard, Mr. Dams. But, of course, we don't grumble at that. Now, take me. I've had an easy day today. Just come from investigating a suicide in Church Street, Kensington. Indeed, another poor devil who couldn't stand the pace of our modern living, I suppose. I suppose so, Doctor. Though you'd have thought this bloke had everything he wanted. He was quite a successful writer, they tell me. A writer? What was his name? He wrote for the Strand magazine. Name was Chudley Stoner. <laughs> Dr. Watson, you dropped that glass. You say Chudley Stoner committed suicide tonight? That's right, Mr. Holmes. You know him? Under what circumstances was he found? It was a routine case, sir. Locked the door on his study from the inside and then blew his brains out. The windows were locked and there were no secret panels and that kind of stuff. It was suicide, all right. Hmm, the arm of coincidence is long indeed, but not as long as that. Has the body been moved? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I told him to touch nothing until the police photographers got there. Just to be on the safe side, you understand, sir. Splendid. Grab your coat and hat, Watson. Right, your home. But what's all the excitement, Mr. Holmes? It's just a suicide. Nonsense, Inspector. I'll stake my whole reputation that Chudley Stoner has been the victim of a murder plot as cunning and diabolical as any that I've ever encountered. In just a moment, we'll find out if Sherlock Holmes is correct in deducing that this is murder. Well, Dr. Watson, this is really one for the book. A mystery writer comes to Sherlock Holmes with a fictitious murder plot. Holmes solves it for him, then the man goes away and gets murdered in exactly the way he described. Precisely, Mr. Bell. As provocative a problem as ever we encountered. I bet you hurried off to the dead man's house at once, didn't you? As fast as a handsome cab could take us there. As soon as we arrived, we cross-examined the three members of the household. The dead man's wife, Violet, her brother, Henry Seal, and Andre LaRue, the secretary. All of them told the same story. They, that they'd heard the shot and hastened to the room from different parts of the house. They said that they looked through the keyhole, found it was blocked, and then the two men broke down the door. Just the same story as in the dead man's fictional problem, wasn't it? What happened next, Dr. Watson? Well, before we talk to the three suspects any further, Holmes, Inspector Lestrade, and I walked into the dead man's study to examine the body. I can almost hear Holmes now, as he said... Hmm. It's not hard to find a motive. A beautiful wife, a worthless brother who'd been told to get out, an attractive and attentive young French secretary who hated the dead man's cruelty. Blimey. And I called it just a routine suicide. You'll notice that no wax pellet is in evidence this time. I'd say that the answer is obvious. The dead man did write some notes on his story last night. The killer found them and realized that he'd been presented with a perfect murder method never expecting that the dead man would divulge his method to me. Mr. Holmes, why are you examining the key hole of the door? I was looking for a pellet of wax, Inspector. It's missing. Obviously, the murderer had read about that in the dead man's notes and was clever enough to remove it. But uh, let's examine the corpse. Hmm. Interesting. Most interesting. Why, Holmes? Well, surely you can see for yourself, Watson. The bloodstains clearly indicate that the man fell here some five or six feet from the desk. And yet, with a dying burst of energy, he crawled towards the desk and clutched it. Undoubtedly, he was trying to give us a dying message. But how can holding on to a desk give a message, Mr. Holmes? And why should a dying man try to do that anyway? Remember that the dead man was a writer and a student of, a student of criminology. In his last few moments of consciousness, he probably realized I'd be on the track of his murderer. He gave us more than one clue, Holmes. Look at his body. As he fell for the last time, he upset that bowl of violets. 
and his wife's name is Violet. Coincidence, I think, Watson. The flowers were knocked over inadvertently as he fell. But the move to the desk was a deliberate and desperate effort. Well, uh, if you talk about that, look here, gentlemen. Lying by his right arm. Look, that was knocked off the desk, too. It's a seal with a monogram on it. Right, Doctor. And Seal is the name of the dead man's brother-in-law. Henry Seal. Interesting, but I refuse to believe that a dying man could deliberately knock over such a comprehensive number of incriminating objects as he died. Then who do you suppose did do it, Holmes? At this stage of the case, I shall suppose nothing, Watson. We have uh, three obvious suspects waiting for us. Let's question them. Why they want us here? I know nothing. Quiet, about please. Mister Elms wants to ask you some questions. I... No, Inspector. I only wish to ask them one question. You, Missus Stoner, how did you occupy your time while you were waiting for the police to arrive? I was so nervous that, to try to calm myself, I did some knitting. I do quite a lot of knitting for the Coast Guard men, you know. I see. And you, Mister Seal, what were your movements before the police arrived? I sat in the library, Mr. Holmes, playing solitaire. And you, André? I, I went to my room and worked on my account books. I realized that my job here was finished and I thought I would get my books in order. I see. That's all for now, thank you. Come along, Henry. Uh, Lestrade. Yes, Mr. Down. I'd like you to get me those three objects spoken of. The knitting, the cards, and the account books. Right you are, Mr. Down. I don't see that you found out much there, Holmes. Don't you, Watson? I'd have thought my line of reasoning was obvious. What are you doing? Kneeling at that keyhole. You said that this time the pellet of wax had been removed. True, Watson. But even though the pellet's been removed, I'm quite sure there'll be traces of wax inside the keyhole. And there are. Splendid. I shall remove this lock and take it back to Baker Street. The murderer undoubtedly still had some traces of wax on his fingers. A closer examination of the fragments of wax inside this keyhole and uh, an equally close examination of the knitting, of the cards, and the account books should be able to give us the solution to this case. Well, Holmes, you've been poring over the microscope for nearly an hour. Have you got the answer? Nearly, but not quite. But you've examined all three of the objects. Surely it's just a question of finding which one of them shows traces of wax. Oh, no, old chap. Huh? It's not as easy as that. Oddly enough, the knitting, the pack of cards, and the account books all show traces of wax. Great Scott. But that means that all those people were involved in the murder. It was concerted plan between the three of them. I think not, Watson. What? And in five more minutes, I'm sure I can prove to you who the murderer is. Violet. Violet, uh, why are you sitting alone here in the library? Oh, hello, Andre. I'm so upset. They think that Chad was murdered. The inspector's still questioning Henry. I believe they think he did it. Oh, it's awful. Oh. oh, now, don't worry, darling. Everything is going to be all right. Please, Andre. But Chad's body hardly cold. But surely, now that he is dead, uh, you always made me believe that if he were dead, we could be together, darling. I was insane. I thought he was neglecting me, that perhaps there was some other woman. But just before he died, we had a talk. I knew it was going to be all right again. But me? You mean you were making a fool of me? I was making a fool of myself, Andre. Please forget it. Forget it? No, my cold-blooded English woman. I am not some stupid boy you can play with. You cannot throw me aside. I have risked my life for your happiness. Risked your... Andre! You murdered Chad! Of course I did. I hated him. And I hated the way he made you unhappy. And the fool gave me the perfect way to do it by telling me about his filthy story. And then forgetting that he had done so. You devil, get away from me. I'm turning you over to the police. No, you are not. You are going to join Chud since you love him so much. Andre, put away that oh, revolver. Nice shooting, Watson. 
You've got him in the wrist. Oh, sorry. Mrs. Turner, are you all right? Yes, but thank heaven you were both behind those curtains. I'm sorry that we had to wait until the last minute to disclose our presence. But it's just as well to have witnesses to a murder confession. What do you have to say for yourself, Monsieur Leroux? Nothing. Send for your policeman and have me taken to prison. With pleasure. Watson, ask Inspector Lestrade to step in here, will you? Tell him we have a customer for him. A customer for the gallows. Midnight. It would be good to get back to Baker Street. It's, it's been an exhausting evening's work. Yes, Watson. A sordid case. A shabby patchwork of discontent and hatred. Oh, well, we've been instrumental in sending yet another felon to his rightful destiny. You know, Holmes, there's still one or two points I don't quite understand. I can't believe it, Watson. What are they? Well, you said that all three objects you examined contained traces of wax. They did, and at well, first that confused me. But there are various qualities of wax. For instance, Mrs. Stoner was knitting with a certain waxed wool that is used specifically in knitting for seafaring men. It uh, gives the garments a weatherproof finish. Never heard of it. Possibly not, but it's a fact. And, uh, as you know, I specialize in such odd pieces of information. Uh, what about the traces of wax on the cards that Henry Seal used when he was playing solitaire? Again, I was misled. Until I remembered that Mrs. Stoner told us that her brother had been playing the violin a short while before her husband's death. Oh, he'd been using rosin. Precisely. Oh, yes. Logically, it uh, had to be the secretary. But the proof came when I made the final analysis of the three specimens of wax. Uh, that... Uh, on the account books, was the only one that exactly matched the traces of wax I found in the keyhole. Oh, I suppose I'm very stupid, Holmes. Hmm. Uh, anything else bothering you? Yes, this one point. You said that the dying man tried to indicate his murderer by clasping the desk as he died. Yes, I'm sure he was trying to give us a dying message. Well, I was fooled by the violets and the seal. Well, that was a freakish coincidence. But the effort in crawling to the desk was not... That was the true message. I still don't see it. Oh, come now, Watson. The secretary was a Frenchman. The French word for desk and for secretary is the same. Secretaire. I see it now. Oh, really, Watson? You know, Holmes, you'll never get your fee for this case. Indeed. And why? Stone is dead. He'll never sell that story to the Strand magazine now. True, Watson. But uh, I've no doubt that you will. Though perhaps it'll be a slightly different version of it. And you'll probably call it something very melodramatic. Um, perhaps, uh, murder in the locked room. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, I'll never think next week. Next week, I, I think I shall tell you how Holmes and I returned to Baker Street one afternoon to find our rooms occupied by a beautiful young woman on the verge of hysteria. Well, that sounds promising. And who was the beautiful young woman? No, 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 <laughs> Mr. Bell, Mr. Bell, I've told you more about this. You'll have to wait till next week to find that out. <laughs> I will say, however... That her story was horrifying enough to make our hair stand on end. I call this adventure Death in the North Sea. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Dancing Men. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about Death in the North. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.